Hi there. I'm Dr. Larry Chu, and welcome to this episode of Stanford MedX Live for Tuesday, January 14th, 2014. This program is a weekly live recorded broadcast and tweet chat from the organizers of Stanford Medicine X, a conference that explores the intersection of emerging technology and medicine. The views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are those of the individual participants and not necessarily those of the Stanford University School of Medicine or the Medicine X conference organizers. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. As the moderator of today's broadcast, I'll be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's panel. Sarah Kucharski, otherwise known as Afternoon Napper, is moderating the online tweet chat discussion tonight. Please also make sure to like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX to stay up to date with all of our program information. Please note that you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real-time events and the live stream that you're watching. Tweets from our in-studio guest panelists will appear before you see the real-time events that they are tweeting about reflected in the live stream. The topic of today's show is the student perspective in digital health and medicine, with a focus, of course, on Stanford Medicine X and the role we aim to play in bringing all healthcare stakeholders together, including students, to look at solving problems in healthcare, particularly at the intersection of emerging technologies and medicine. With me today is an interdisciplinary panel of student leaders, folks who I believe will be leading the healthcare innovation in the future. The goal of this program is to hear from them, have them share their view with us of the future of healthcare, and how their experiences at the Medicine X conference have shaped their thinking on these issues. And of course, to answer your questions out there from our viewing audience on Twitter. Let me start off by introducing our panel of students today. I'm gonna to go alphabetically. We'll begin with Emily Bradley. Emily is a Stills disease and rare disease e-patient who blogs at chroniccurve.com. She studies psychology and biology at Florida State University and is passionate about improving chronic pain management and participatory medicine. Emily was selected as an e-patient scholar at Medicine X 2013. Anna Clemenson is a Medicine X 2014 student advisor. She is an AIM Lab alumna and current student at the Duke University School of Nursing. Matt Erlinson is joining us from New Haven, Connecticut. He is a Medicine X 2014 student advisor, an AIM Lab alumni, and currently a student at the Yale University School of Medicine. Nikki Estenal is a 2013 Stanford Medicine XE patient scholar and a current student at California State University, Long Beach. Joining us in Canada is Francisco Grajales, who is a doctoral student in the eHealth Strategy Office at the University of British Columbia Faculty of Medicine. His dissertation explores the use of health-related social networking site data by third parties and how these align with user privacy expectations. Cisco also collaborates and co-directs a number of ongoing international research projects on e-health services research. Joining us from Portland, Oregon is Rohit Kakade. Um, he is a MD candidate at the Oregon Health and Science University he is a two-time Medicine X attendee and a blogger at thebiopsy.com. Rohit's interests lay at the intersection of digital health, medical education, design, and tech culture. He serves as a, a Medicine X student advisor for 2014. Let me take a quick uh, moment to mention afternoon napper Sarah Kucharski. She is moderating 
the online discussion on Twitter this evening. Uh, make sure to uh, follow her at Afternoon Napper in order to join the discussion that's going on with the MedX hashtag. Sarah is a writer and magazine editor, an e-patient, healthcare social media consultant, public speaker, founder of the rare disease organization, FMD Chat, and of course, a member of the Stanford Medicine X e-patient advisory panel. And finally, last but not least, Nicholas Vu. Uh, Nicholas likes to classify himself as an amateur pharmacy futurist, technology lover, and a student working towards his PharmD at the University of California, San Diego. He makes a mean bowl of Vietnamese pho and occasionally hits the surf in San Diego. He also serves as a MedX student advisor for 2014. So welcome everyone uh, to this panel discussion tonight on student perspectives at Medicine X and uh, student perspectives on digital health and medicine. Um, I, I have to admit I've been very excited to have this panel. This will be one of several panels during this year uh, looking at the student perspective. Uh, I think it's actually really important because students represent the future of medicine and if we're going to make changes uh, in medicine that will be sustainable and long-lasting, of course we need to be working with today's students who will be tomorrow's future leaders. I'd like to get things started today by just going around and having each of our students tell us a little bit about where they are in their education. We have a broad range of healthcare students, uh, students studying many different subjects. Tell us a little bit about where you are in, where you are in your educational process just to get things started um, before we go ahead and, and dive deep into some of these questions. So let's start with Emily. Emily, tell us a little bit about where you're going to school and where you are in your education. So I go to school at Florida State University, which is in Northwest Florida. Um, I'm actually in my third year of undergrad, but after taking time off, I think that makes me like a super senior this year. That's what they call it. <laughs> um, I'm studying psych with a minor in bio, and I'm not really sure where I'm headed. I am taking my pre-physician assistant requirements, um, but I've got a couple doors open. Medicine X kind of changed my outlook on what I want to do, and I'm still trying to figure out where that's going to bring me. Great. Wonderful to have you here. Um, let's go to Anna Clemenson from North Carolina. How are you doing tonight, Anna? Sorry, I forgot to unmute there. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it's been a long day for me. We just started school again. Um, as Dr. Chu was saying, I go to the Duke University School of Nursing, and I'm currently in my second semester. Um, our program is only 16 months, so by this time next year, we'll be graduated and, and kind of going on to our next step. I'm not entirely sure what I want to do yet, um, but we're going through a lot of rotations right now, so hopefully um, I'll have a better answer for you as time goes on. But it's still extremely exciting, and I'm very happy to be here. Well, thanks for joining us. We're going to go next to Matt Erlinson from... Uh, Yale University. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so I'm currently a first year medical student uh, at uh, Yale School of Medicine. Um, uh, usually med school will be about uh, four years. About uh, two thirds of our class end up doing an optional fifth year for research or another project. Um, Medicine X has also kind of changed my perspective on how to uh, approach healthcare. So I, I am interested in academic medicine, but at the same time I'm kind of interested in this new healthcare uh, IT sort of approach to solving some of healthcare uh, healthcare's problems. Wonderful. Um, let's turn now to Nikki. Nikki Estenal. Tell us how you're doing tonight. Hi, I'm a little bit laggy I think, but <clears throat> I'm right now a third year undergrad at Cal State Long Beach and I'm studying international studies and after going to MedEx I think I want to head to grad school for medical humanities so within international studies I'm trying to take some medical sociology type classes in there. Wonderful so we've already heard from two students whose um, interests have been um, motivated or, or really affected in some way by their experience at MedEx and we're going to dive into that in a little bit but let's continue with the, the, the introduction so uh, Francisco Grajales, or Cisco, as we like to call you. Tell us how you're doing these days. 
Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I'm doing very well. Uh, I'm currently on the second year of my PhD, and I will be hopefully finishing up this year. So graduating by just before my third year is my plan. Um, in terms of Medicine X, Medicine X changed my life in a lot of ways, but the big one that I can say is it allowed me to work uh, with patients like me and, and uh, get some data uh, and work also very closely with the Institute of Medicine. Uh, and so that's how Medicine X changed my perspective and my research and, and I was able to work with some amazing people. So I'm very excited to hear about everyone's experience and to uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about that. Wonderful. Um, Ro Rohit, um, so Rohit, we go way back to the first MedX when I called you out from the main stage and mentioned your amazing blog posts. <laughs> yeah, uh, we do. Uh, t tell me a little bit about where you are in your career right now. Well, just like Matt, I'm in my first year of medical school at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Um, I'm just, I think, six months in or so, and um, Mesonex was a real perspective changer for me. I learned a lot about where my true interests lie, and uh, I hope to, to pursue research in it as well. Wonderful. And Nicholas, Nicholas Vu, um, tell us a little bit about uh, pharmacy training. You're, um, you're currently pursuing a degree as a PharmD. Tell us more about where you are in your career. Yeah, so I've recently finished my third year of pharmacy school. It's a four-year program. Um, I've gotten all of my pharmacological therapeutics training, and um, I'll be starting our clinical rotations uh, here in July where I'll have all of the opportunities in the world to incorporate as many digital health and mobile apps into my practice um, as humanly possible. So um, going to Stanford MedX really changed my perspective on how technology can really affect the pharmacy profession. And um, the, real, the real benefit that I gained from going to MedX was focusing my efforts on the technologies that were presented at the conference and meeting uh, the people that were responsible for developing those technologies. Well, wonderful. You know, it's really heartening for me to hear um, from, from you guys about some of the impact Medicine X has had on your career choices, your vision of healthcare in the future. Um, and I look forward to diving a little deeper into to that uh, in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to take a time out to, uh, to shout out on Twitter to the people who are joining us. Uh, Don Gibson, Kathy Kastner, Jill Friedman, Patty Kobleski, Britt Johnson, thank you for joining us. Uh, Marie Ennis O'Connor, okay, I'm really being challenged with the names here. Amal Utrankar, uh, one of our e patients, Joe Rife, and Jennifer Salapek, thanks so much for joining us online. As you know, there's a simultaneous tweet chat happening right now on Twitter. If you're following this uh, conversation online or on Twitter, Afternoon Napper is moderating the discussion tonight on the MedX hashtag. We have with us, uh, as a reminder to those of you who have just joined us, a panel of healthcare students who I predict will be among the healthcare leaders of tomorrow. Um, E-patients and healthcare givers out there, what questions do you have for our panel tonight? Um, what might you like to tell them about working with patients and their families and partners as partners in their own care? Healthcare providers, technologists and researchers out there, what do students need to know today to navigate the digital health landscape of tomorrow? What do you see as the biggest challenges for students who want to work in the areas of digital health? Think about those questions. Please tweet your questions to us on the MedX hashtag and Sarah Kucharski will get those questions to me. So let's, I was thinking about how we might have a discussion on the student experience at MedX and um, I will say at the beginning one of the reasons that we wanted to have this uh, tweet chat was to remind everyone that we have a wonderful student scholarship program this year, uh, the student leadership program that aims to bring uh, 10 students from all over the world actually to Medicine X to participate in the conference and we are accepting applications right now. So if any of the conversation tonight is inspiring you to get involved with Medicine X, please go to our website medicinex.stanford.edu 
look for that student leadership program application, apply for it. Um, we are making a commitment here at Medicine X if we get qualified applications to bring at least one student from Europe, one student from South America, uh, Mexico, and one student from Asia. So uh, we really do try to bring some uh, international and geographic diversity to the students we hope to support and bring to the conference. Um, let's, let's dive in a little bit and talk about the student experience a bit. Uh, when I was thinking about how we might approach the subject tonight, I thought maybe we'd break it up into shared experiences. Uh, because when I was thinking about the students here, I think many of you have shared experiences uh, in different aspects of the program. Um, I'm going to start with shared experiences around creating and doing Medicine X. So uh, I think the two people who are smirking right now are Anna Clemenson and Matt Erlinson um, because they both were uh, uh, AIM Lab alumni and had an integral role to play in making Medicine X happen from uh, figuring out the smallest tiny details to executing the big plan. Uh, let's start with Let's start with Matt Erlinson. Uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about your experience as a doer, being really the operational lead on MedEx and being part of creating that conference for people. Um, what was that like for you? Um, well, it was definitely a, uh, a pretty incredible experience. Um, I would say that I came into uh, Medicine X not knowing um, you know, a lot about uh, emerging technology in healthcare and participatory medicine, and uh, by the time I was done, I felt like I had learned uh, quite, a, quite a great deal from um, attendees, e-patients, um, and a lot of the professionals who ended up coming. Um, a lot of stuff's going on behind the scenes at Medicine X, I think, that uh, you know, maybe people aren't aware about, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, share, maybe share with our audience one little behind-the-scenes thing that happens at Medicine X that people might not be aware of, but that that we pay attention to these details on, give, just to give them an idea of some of the stuff that you're working on. Oh, okay. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I would say that uh, filming each of the uh, the lectures requires significant attention to detail. Um, you never know what can go wrong when you're doing something live, <laughs> as we are doing right now. Um, uh, let's see. Some other things of behind the scenes, the little flourishes from uh, flowers to the balloons to uh, all the different staging cues. There's a lot going on back there. Well, yeah, and uh, and maybe Anna can talk a little bit more about some of the special flourishes, particularly one with four legs, maybe. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yes, my, my favorite Medicine X attendee is obviously Zoe Chu. Um, she is dearly loved by our lab. Uh, I think we all, she, she started in there as a puppy and so she's always been an integral part and, and we love to bring her to conferences and she loves to meet people. So uh, one of the things that I do behind the scenes is I, um, you know, uh, keep her company, let her go out and meet people, take her outside for breaks. Um, but as Matt was saying, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And uh, it was a very interesting and an incredible experience to participate in uh, creating the conference, especially working, um, you know, with Dr. Chu's kind of a mastermind and, and driving force behind all of these, these um, ideas that we put together. Uh, as Matt said, um, he talked a little bit about filming. I was uh, pretty involved with uh, filming of the outbreak sessions that we have at Medicine X. So um, being in there early, before the crack of dawn, figuring out the sound, uh, checking if everything works, figuring out if the projectors work OK, how's the video quality, um, all the way down to the little details, like Matt was saying. I can remember one night we stayed up very late sorting the little M&Ms into all the packets and then putting those packets under all the chairs so that everyone could participate in the game. Um, that, that we would have for everybody. Um, but even being behind the scenes, uh, it was a very different perspective, but we still, I think, got um, a good look at what Medicine X is. I, I know for myself, um, 
kind of before all of this started, it was easy to think of healthcare as, um, you know, kind of being in, in medicine or in a hospital setting. But I think one of the things for Medicine X is it shows um, how diverse it can be and who all your collaborators really are out there. And so that was uh, wonderful to see. Well, you know, I, I for one, want to take a moment to both recognize Anna and Matt for the really amazing contributions they made to making Medicine X happen. Uh, they really, um, people don't realize what a big role students have in the conference every year. The conference couldn't happen without students. And uh, a lot of the great ideas and creative uh, concepts that we execute uh, at the conference, you know, I bounce them off of the students because uh, in, in many ways, you know, they're, they're also on the cutting edge there with us in terms of using social media, figuring out how this new form of communication works and how we can reach out to people. Um, speaking of social media and um, the topic of um, reaching, new, reaching people through new ways of communication, let's talk about social media and blogging. We had a lot of bloggers at the conference uh, the past few years. Um, Rohit, Rohit Kakaday being one of them. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into blogging. Um, you made a, an impact at the first Medicine X when um, you compared Medicine X to a nightclub in yeah. your first blog post. Tell us a little bit how you got into blogging and, 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 and what you're doing in that area. Sure. Um, well, I started my blog during the senior year of college and it was primarily a way for me to learn outside of the classroom. Um, I used it as a personal learning platform. So I joined Twitter, I looked at Kevin MD, and I basically condensed all these information sources that I thought would make me a better healthcare provider in the future. So I just kept reading up on things that were happening. And then when Medicine X came on my radar, I knew that I had to be at that conference. Um, it was all about emerging technologies in medicine. And classically, during my pre-med years, you're never really exposed to emerging technologies. It's more the classical sciences, so biochemistry, stuff like that. You hear about Nobel laureates, but you don't hear about the, the digital entrepreneurs who are trying to make medicine better in a different way. So that's why that's how I came about uh, coming to Medicine X. Now what I'm doing with my blog is like I'm continuing it through a medical school, once again keeping it open as a personal learning platform and for a way for me to expose my ideas to the public and gain uh, feedback on whether they're good or not, and whether I should uh, pursue them. Well, uh, and I will comment. I think you know we are seeing more and more blogging by medical students. Uh, even here at Stanford, the Scope blog at the School of Medicine has started a new project called Stanford Medical School Unplugged, where they're um, bringing a cohort of. Uh, five or so medical students to share their their journey into medicine and hopefully that is going to be some of some of the those are going to be some of the things that will remove the silos between uh, institutions and, and allow people to see what it really takes to build a career in medicine um, before we move on a question from Kirsten Walters on Twitter what entails being a good provider to you what skills are needed that others may not have? I think I'm going to throw that question to one of our e-patient students. Um, maybe I'm going to give that question to Nikki. Tell us a, a little bit about what you think it entails to be a good provider and what skills are needed that others may not have. Um, well, I have a good example with my new rheumatologist who was very collaborative in her approach to um, in, our, in my new plan for my RA. So she took what I wanted, I gave her a list of my goals, she took that, and not only did she listen, we created a plan based around what she thought was good and what I wanted. So, so I think being really empathetic and just listening to the patient and using their empathy side, but at the same time using their you know knowledge to create a, a plan that works for both parties. That's, that's, my, that's my big thing. Well, wonderful. And speaking of that approach, um, that really that approach of partnering with patients and participatory medicine, question from Lisa Bernstein as a follow-up. 
Are you seeing similar interest in participatory medicine at your school? Uh, and I'm going to throw that out to a bunch of you in rapid succession. Let me start with Emily Bradley. Uh, participatory medicine, are you seeing that topic covered in your school? It really is class dependent. Um, I'm not in medical school. I'm still an undergrad. Um, so it, in the larger sciences, I'm not seeing a ton of it. But where I am seeing it is the, the medical humanities and the more anatomy and physiology based classes. I find we talk about um, patients much more than we do in just you know the, the 300, 400 person lecture for biology. Um, but I think as, as more students are using Twitter and Facebook, you know we're, this, we're the social media generation. Um, I think it's inevitable that it's growing. And I think, um, you know, we are at the cusp, and I think it's getting patient voices such as yours, such as Nikki, out there will help bring that message of participatory medicine home. Uh, Matt Erlinson, I'm going to come to you next. I'm interested to know at Yale University School of Medicine, you're a first year medical student. Um, what do you see in terms of involving patients in medicine or uh, stories of participatory medicine uh, in your curriculum, in your institution? Uh, have you been exposed to this? Um, I would say definitely yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the first uh, summer assignments that we had before school started was reading uh, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by um, Anne Fadiman. Um, which is really kind of a story about uh, a failure to communicate when delivering health care. Um, it's kind of a, a, a story of uh, a team of physicians struggling to uh, really provide the best care because they were so set in kind of providing what is by the book the best type of care when it wasn't necessarily the best type of care um, for that individual patient. Um, so I would say from even before day one we were really uh, focusing on how to involve uh, patients in their care because um, I believe it was Will, uh, William Osler said, you know, listen to the patient, the patient is giving you the diagnosis. Um, so I think that's something very important um, that we should uh, all be looking at. I think that's great and, I, and I'm actually incredibly pleased to hear that, that they're covering those topics already in your first year. Um, I'm going to go to you, Nicholas. Uh, next, I want you to talk a little bit about um, participatory medicine uh, in pharmacy. Tell us a little bit about what you've been exposed to. And also, I want you to tell me a little bit about um, what you might be blogging about these days, because you are also another one of our students who uh, was a blogger at Medicine X. Yeah, that's a great question, Larry. And a number of the the, the, the main exposure that I've gotten uh, with regard to digital health is just through um, researching all of the technologies out there via Twitter and Facebook, um, attending conferences like Stanford MedEx, uh, the Wireless Life Sciences Alliance's Conversion Summit, and bringing everything that I've learned um, into um, uh, my school's pharmacy informatics course. And um, there are, you know, sensors that bind to inhalers. You know, pharmacists are now able to prescribe under physicians' protocols. Um, there are activity trackers, you know, we're certified diabetes educators, we're in a position to prescribe a number of these devices. Um, and it's really just been um, a great opportunity to, 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 learn, to learn about all of these, all of these technologies so remotely. Um, and in between all of my classes and all of the studying, whenever I'm kind of brain fried, I my, my breaks really consist of researching this material and then posting what I'm reading um, on, my, on my Twitter feed, my, uh, my Hootsuite account, and my Facebook. And then all of my friends and classmates and clinician colleagues are, are on Facebook as well, uh, many of which are actually my professors. So it's, it's really just one of the most efficient ways to disseminate information without having to um, take the time to, uh, to, to meet with them because it's very difficult to meet with you know all of my all of my uh, colleagues in the school, I think that's a great point. I think one of the things social media really does is open up a world of collaboration, of working with people who um, you might not normally come across every day, uh, and that's actually a good segue into a question from Chris Sebastian from Twitter. Um, Chris asks, how did your experience at MedX 
cause you to discover new opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration and healthcare delivery. Uh, and I, I think this is actually a great panel to talk about this because if you think about it, we have here with us undergraduate students, we have medical students, we have nursing student, we have a pharmacy student. Um, we really have a really great broad interdisciplinary group of students that I somehow don't think would necessarily be talking to each other if it weren't for a conference like Medicine X. Um, Francisco Grajales, I'm going to throw this question to you, uh, partly because as a researcher, collaboration is something that's very important. Can you help answer Chris Sebastian's question about how your experience at MedX caused you to discover new opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration or healthcare delivery? Absolutely, Larry, and thank you very much. I think what you get used to when you go to a conference is either you go to the HIMSTEP conference where everyone's trying to sell you something, or you go to the academic conference where everyone's talking about p-values. But very seldomly do you go to the same conference, and not only do you get someone who is starting a new company and is, you know, going forward extremely quicker than expected, but you also get the academics, you also get uh, the practitioners, you also get the students. And, you know, part of the beauty of the conference is the venue and and the, 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 the experience where you're really able to have an intimate conversation with all of these people under the same roof, sitting around the couch, whether it's during the meal, whether it's during um, there's so many activities that are going on, the, the health walks, whatever else, they really allow a, an opportunity for uh, cross-pollination and harmonization of ideas because, you know, a clinician may have a problem, for example, an anesthesiologist, when he's trying to label lines, may have it, may be difficult for him because his stray is this big, you know, 30 by or 12 by 10, and you've got tubes up the wazoo when you're dealing with them. That makes it very difficult. But when you have the engineer right beside you who's a student who can think of a million different ways to get a product out to you, if you are not an engineer before you went to medical school, the likelihood of you thinking of those ideas and being able to come hand to hand right away with someone who can help you get there is very difficult. And so I think that's where the conference provides a platform for people to collaborate in different disciplines across uh, sectors and and uh, and facets, really. Great. I mean, I, yeah, I think that you really hit on one of the hallmarks of Medicine X, which you know, um, we have this tagline: Medicine X is a conference designed for everyone. Uh, it really is about embracing all the stakeholders in healthcare. And one thing I will add: when we talk about interdisciplinary collaboration, um, one of those disciplines, I guess you could call it, if you want to talk about inter collaboration, is patience. Um, one other thing that I think is very unique about Medicine X is how we really embrace the patient voice. We really believe patients are important collaborators if we're going to try to innovate in healthcare. And I think what I want to do is actually turn next to Nikki and Emily. Um, they are students they are patients, e-patients, and they both spoke at Medicine X. So when we talk about the other experiences at Medicine X, let's talk about the experience of speaking at Medicine X. Emily, um, uh, maybe you can start talking about the experience of speaking at Medicine X, being asked, I don't know, it was the week before the conference to come on stage and be part of a panel. What was that like? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was like two or three weeks. It wasn't too bad, um, but it was it was nerve wracking and it was challenging. Um, I think what really stood out to MedX, and especially with speaking um, and hearing others speak, is that I was challenged and I was challenged as a patient, but I was also challenged as a student. Um, you know those biases that you don't necessarily know you have. For me that's what was challenged when I was on stage and when I was listening to others on stage. Um, once I spoke, when I got off stage, what really blew my mind was the amount of people that came up to me from interdisciplinary fields. It was just uh, pharmacy students, pharmacists, providers, 
designers, I mean, you name it, um, that wanted to talk, that wanted to talk ideas, that wanted to collaborate. Um, and as a patient, usually we're left out of the loop. Um, so to have everyone come around and say, yeah, okay, we want, we want you, you know, we want your ideas, we want your help, we want your opinions, uh, that was quite literally life changing for me, and it still is. I'm still I'm still feeling that that life changing effect. You know, I still get emails, um, and that to me is I don't I don't have words for that. You know, to me that's indescribable. So. Well, I think um, uh, I want to turn it over to Nikki next. Uh, Nikki, um, you were another speaker at our conference. I think, like Emily, um, the experience that uh, of speaking at Medicine X it can be quite moving and inspirational, not only for the speaker but for the audience. Tell us about your experience being on that main stage and and sharing your story with the audience. Oh man! Um, <clears throat> so, like Emily said, it was it was great to have people from all avenues of healthcare approach you after. It was like I didn't think anybody would really care about, you know, like a small patient story, but I mean, going up on stage, I thought everyone was going to be in a white lab coat with a checkboard, doctors, judging me and everything, but it was not even like that. I had researchers approach me after, say how, how they didn't really see the perspective that I was speaking about as a young patient. And it was just, you know, you, you kind of expect to affect other patients, and it was great to hear other e-patients, you know, tell me that what I said resonated with them. But to have somebody like a researcher or a professor come up to me and tell me that they had never heard that or realized what really goes on as a patient, that what was that's what really hit me and that's what really affected me being up there. It was I didn't expect to reach those people, but I guess just being an addict like like everybody else said, it was the perfect opportunity for all those people to come and, and blend together and listen to each other. Nikki, what did it did you what did it feel like going into the conference with your student e patient hat on, uh, and maybe coming out of it thinking or learning that you have something to teach and share other people? Uh, what was it like wearing those two hats? Um, firstly, I didn't really come in with a student mentality. I didn't even think about it, but. During the conference, I found myself um, emailing my professor. I took a medicine and literature class. So we talked about um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, Rita Sharon, works like that. I was emailing my teacher frantically, like, you need to send this link to all your students. You need to watch this. This is exactly what we're talking about in class. So, so I got in touch with her, and I ended up speaking with her after the conference about similar issues in like participatory medicine. I actually met professors there that I approached and I said, hey, this is, I mean, I know you presented on technology, but I have this really great idea about, you know, like Emily and I, we're so interested in going to these classes and speaking and giving our perspective as a patient, but it could be so difficult. So I was able to connect with professors there. They gave me ideas of what departments to go to, how I should approach the professors how the system of education works and what we could do. So after that, I, I realized that I need to do something in this field and not just do The good thing about an international studies major, you can take so many different courses. So after MedEx, I wanted to wear both hats at once, I guess you could say. And um, I just talked to an advisor. I couldn't just, all of a sudden I had this epiphany. I want to be a bio major. But realistically, that wasn't going to happen. So. From after that, I um, I talked to my international studies um, advisor, and we just are trying to pick classes here and there that could align with medical humanities in the future, and and from there work on combining the two um, areas of study. I love it. That's that's fantastic to, to hear that. You know, you got that perspective coming out of the conference. Uh, I want to take a moment, real quick to remind those of you who are just joining us that um, this is a live program. There is a chat happening on Twitter simultaneously. And Sarah Kucharski, otherwise known as Afternoon Napper, is moderating the discussion tonight on the Medex hashtag. We have with us a panel of students who, as I've said before, I predict will be among healthcare leaders of tomorrow. 
I want to ask the e-patients and caregivers out there, what questions do you have for our panel of students? What might you like to tell them about working with patients and their families as partners in their own care? Healthcare providers, technologists, researchers out there, what do students need to know today to navigate the digital health landscape of tomorrow? What do you see as the biggest challenges for students who want to work in the area of digital health? Tweet us your questions or responses, and we'll do our best to have the panel tonight address them on this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live for Tuesday, January 14th, 2014. So um, let me transition to another topic. Um, we announced earlier this month that we're, we have a partnership with our sister conference, Doctors 2.0 in Paris. And one of the things that we aim to do is to bring student uh, to both conferences, uh, to Doctors 2.0 in Paris uh, in the spring, and then to MedicineX at Stanford in the fall. Uh, part of it is to try to bridge these two conferences and bring what's happening in Europe uh, to the United States and bring it some of the experience and perspective of what's happening here in the US over to Europe. I am going to turn the conversation over to Anna and Matt right now, uh, who both attended the Doctors 2.0 conference in Paris. Tell us, Anna, what, um, why students might want to go to the Doctors 2.0 meeting, why they might want to apply for the Paris to Palo Alto track in our Stanford uh, student leadership program uh, that aims to provide scholarship funds for students to go to both conferences. Um, well, so uh, going to Doctors 2.0 was a great experience. Um, it was the first time I had really been abroad to another conference and um, it was very interesting to see what it was like um, at a conference that was very similarly focused but kind of in a different country because you definitely get more, much more of the uh, uh, European perspective on what's going on and I definitely think that students should apply because it's a great opportunity to get that experience. Um, we really want students to uh, go and have kind of a cultural immersion and cultural, cultural exchange experience over there. Um, uh, so what we're hoping for is students who are interested in either the uh, um, engagement at, or producer tracks, um, students who have something they want to talk about or something they want to share will also be interested in uh, attending our sister conference um, to kind of be a social media producer on that end and tweet about it and write about what they see and what they hear, what um, differences and similarities they see and I mean, I think a lot of the focus of these conferences is collaboration, so maybe looking at how um, we can take two very different perspectives and see what we can learn from that. Great, fantastic. Matt Erlinson, what is your favorite memory from Doctors 2.0 in Paris? So Doctors 2.0 was really a great experience for me. Um, <clears throat> Denise Silver, Basil Strategies, runs it, um, and I think the next one is... June 5th to 6th, um, but I think what was most memorable for me was the global perspective. Um, we really heard from like, South America, Europe, Asia, um, and a lot about how technology is being used, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a lot about how healthcare is being changed over there, sometimes startups and technology, and um, you know, the healthcare systems are different over there and how, how problems are approached and, and the different laws and, and all that. So it was, it was actually really neat to get a, a different perspective from, uh, from the global community. Um, so uh, the Paris Palo Alto track is uh, really cool because you get to go hear that global perspective in Paris, um, either as an engagement producer track, which um, involves being paired with an e-patient scholar, um, and uh, putting together a paper that will be published on the Stanford Medicine X website. Um, or the presenter track where you uh, will end up doing an oral presentation. You can also apply to the Paris Palo Alto track if um, that global perspective is something that uh, interests you. 
Great. And Matt, thanks for bringing up some of the details about the Stanford Medicine X Student Leadership Program. Uh, as you mentioned, students can apply for scholarship to attend Stanford Medicine X in two tracks. You can apply uh, in the engagement producer track. And there, we really want to have students come, engage, learn how to use social media and blogging to become engaged providers, engaged students, to be part of the conversation of how to improve healthcare. And the second track that they could come in on is the presenter track. And this provides a similar opportunity to give a five minute main stage Ignite talk, similar to what we've seen for the e-patients. Uh, an interesting twist on the engagement and producer track is we are pairing students with e-patients as teams to work and learn from each other. Uh, just another way we hope to try to shape and influence the future of healthcare by reaching out to today's students who will be, of course, leaders tomorrow. Um, you can apply in either of those two tracks, but of course, what we're asking people is if you're also interested in going to Paris, to indicate that by clicking the box that you also want to be considered for the Paris to Palo Alto promotion. I am going to now um, try to address some of the questions that are coming out on Twitter. We had some questions in general regarding blogging for students and students in the healthcare professions. What skills does one need to have to be successful? How does one be a read and write readable content that's accessible to the public. I'm going to throw this to our two uh, meds to our two uh, bloggers. Um, actually, there's many bloggers on this panel, but I'm going to throw this question to Rohit Krakade, our uh, the blogger of the author of the blog, the biopsy. Uh, Rohit, what skills does one need to have to be successful in blogging, and how do you go about writing content that's accessible to everyone? Um, I would say the biggest skill that you need to have is be able to take risks. It takes a lot of courage to put your ideas out there. And I remember when I first started my blog, I had a lot of internal conflict on whether or not I should actually put my ideas out there. I remember one of the first times I uh, submitted my uh, piece to KevinMD.com, I received a lot of negative comments about it. But sooner or later, people started coming to me and saying they agreed with me. Um, the biggest skill, though, in general, is being able to write short-form uh, blogs, posts, really well. Uh, we live in an era where attention is at a premium, so if you're able to convey your ideas across in a, a small amount of time and with maximal um, effectiveness, you're going to become a lot more popular. One of my favorite bloggers right now is Dr. Brian Bartabedian. He blogs at 33charts.com, and he I look to him as kind of the master of short-form. So I would say that's one of the biggest skills uh, you can have to engage other uh, people online. That's wonderful. And speaking of master of short form, uh, Dr. V and uh, Wendy Sue Swanson, of course, taught a master class at Medicine X uh, on their work as uh, social media experts uh, in medicine. Just some of the things that our students who attend Medicine X get to participate in. Uh, and I'm going to now go to Nicholas Vu. You did some great work uh, in writing up your experiences at Medicine X and sharing them on various blogs. Uh, what's your advice? Um, what skills does one need to have to be successful? Uh, and how do you make your content accessible to uh, everyone? Right. So um, when it came to writing readable content at, um, in the digital health arena, I pretty much just write about what it is that I see. I don't, I, I don't, I, I, I try my best to summarize it, but my entire blog on the Stanford MedX conference was just me sitting in the conference and then writing down virtually everything that the speakers were speaking about, um, virtually everything that was surrounding the environment. And then um, I submitted my, my summary to a number of um, high profile uh, websites uh, out there and then there was one that um, that accepted it uh, diabetesmind.com so what I do is I try to find um, websites that are heavily followed you know in this case like 15,000 plus followers so 
Um, and I obviously post it on my my personal blog post and my own my own social media websites. And I found that those are the most efficient ways because um, when I, whenever I go out to class or go out to the community, they're like, oh, I saw what you posted on, on your social media. That's cool. What was that? So um, if I didn't use those outlets, there there's no way that I could um, uh, get inform the community as efficiently as I did. Great. We just got a question on Twitter um, that uh, is a follow-up to this question on social media, and I'm going to throw this back to... Um, uh, to our social media panelists here in a second. The question is, health professions teach bedside communication, but how much is healthcare social media and public digital communication part of that curriculum? Um, so I'm going to throw this uh, back to, let's see here, um, Rohit. I'm just going to throw it back to you real quick um, because you are a medical student, uh, you are an active blogger. Um, how are people including training in digital, uh, in social media in medical school? Are they? It's it's variable. Um, some schools have it, some schools don't. Once again, Dr. Brian Vardabinian is leading a digital literacy course at Baylor College of Medicine. It's actually one of the first I've heard of. And um, I believe UC Irvine School of Medicine also has a digital literacy program that's in development. Uh, my school right now does not have much of one, so my experience online is kind of informing everything I do from now on and how I will practice um, and incorporate uh, social media into my day-to-day -day profession. Um, and what's I forgot to mention earlier that short-form blogging is an interesting has an interesting translation into clinical medicine in that uh, doctors today are pressured to see a lot of different patients in a short amount of time. And if we're able to practice our, um, our ability to get out vast amounts of information in a clear and concise manner online, that also translates into something that we can do in real life. So the benefits of having a curriculum in healthcare social media has real life benefits as well. Well, thanks for that answer. And you're certainly one of the students in healthcare that's leading the way on this. I'm, all, I'm going to throw this question to Francisco Verjales. Uh, Cisco, you are a member of the Social Media Interest Group uh, for the uh, uh, International Medical Informatics Association. I'm sure you have a lot to say on this topic. Uh, I have a lot to say. We don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. But uh, I just wanted to say, at least in Canada, uh, we have actually been, when integrating this into medical curricula across the country, the issue is the same as in the United States, it's not standardized. And so for those that are familiar with CanMeds, which is what's being uh, used across the board in Canada, one of the two of the big uh, flower petals in the model for medical education is medical communicator and medical collaborator. And so we're integrating the use of social media to respond to patient requests and to collaborate with patients with um, with with these tools and as a matter of fact the Canadian Medical Association when they release their social media guidelines actually um, encourage physicians to be using these tools so we're using them directly and I can tell you the University of British Columbia, the University of Toronto and the University of Montreal are directly incorporating it and have incorporated it into their curriculum well, you know, my personal experience also confirms that some of the most cutting-edge things are happening in Canada, so my hat off to you Canadians. Uh, you are leading the way in many ways. Uh, I want to take the last few minutes of this broadcast to address a question from Robert West that is on the minds of a lot of people on Twitter right now, and it is the following. Most patients who attend MedEx are e-patients or engaged and empowered patients. Um, or at least educated. Uh, how can we expand our reach to you patients, unempowered patients? In, um, in my class, Engage and Empower Me, uh, which is every Thursday night uh, on Stanford MedX Live, we talked a little bit about patient activation. And so this would be on um, Judith Hibbert's scale, probably a one in terms of activation. Patients who really are not willing or educated enough to be partners on their health. How can we expand our reach to 
uh, increase the activation of e-patients uh, and make them, uh, sorry, not make them, but help them become more engaged to be partners in their healthcare. I'm going to throw this to Emily Bradley and then to Nick, to Nikki Esnall. Emily, um, what are your thoughts? How can we reach the unempowered patients? I think it, it's a it's a multifaceted answer. Um, I'm a huge believer in in starting local and, and building community resources. One of the things we talked about at Medex was how do we how do we reach those patients? How do we reach patients that don't necessarily have the access to the technology we do or limited access? And I really think that if we started to see a different dialogue in the exam room, in the appointment, in the waiting room. Um, that I think we could encourage patients to feel more confident to take control of their care. Um, as for MedEx and online, I think it's starting with our own communities. You know, if, you, if you're watching and you know someone that maybe they're not engaged on Twitter, but you think they're doing a great job and, you know, they're engaged in their own care in their own time, send them the link to the live stream of MedEx and they're going to be riveted. And that's you know, that, I think that's what happened with a lot of us. We weren't necessarily empowered or engaged until someone extended the hand personally. Um, and I think having, having a clear or a clearer definition of what an e-patient is, um, you know, it's not just someone with a chronic disease. There are people that go through life-changing injuries, um, life-changing medical experiences that maybe they aren't necessarily currently dealing with but they've had a life-altering experience, um, you know, everyone's a patient at some point. And if, if you're not a patient yet, you, you know, you love someone that has been and will be. Um, and I think there's a role for everyone. I think we just have to get the word out. And I think, you know, starting at the ground level and saying, hey, watch this. I think you, you'd be perfect for this. Um, I think that's the way to start is locally. I like those words. There, there's, there's a role for everyone in engaging in healthcare and to start locally. Uh, Nikki Essenal, uh, tell us what you think uh, we people can do to reach out to the U patients, the unempowered patients. Um, I just want to build off what Emily said. I think those are the most, most important things: is starting local, starting with yourself. Because I was in that you patient position, I didn't even think about my disease. I was in denial about it. I didn't want to step up. I didn't want to join support groups. I thought it was cheesy. But I mean, my advice would be just to not wait until it gets so bad. And most importantly, for the e patients, I think they have a lot of responsibility to reach out personally to those patients. Because, like Emily said, you know, you don't really want to get into it unless someone reaches out to you personally. And I think everybody at MedEx is doing a great job of reaching out. Um, secondly, starting local and like with the dialogue in the doctor's office, I think also doctors, it, it's important to you know teach them the whole, the empathy, the participatory medicine, so that once they're in that position, they'll be more likely to help the patient that's not empowered. And thirdly, um, everyone has a role, like you said, that kind of builds on what we just discussed, but Emily mentioned caregivers, and I think if you're not an e-patient, you definitely know somebody who has gone through something. I mean, you might become a patient eventually in life. So putting the caregivers in that position to help empower and to show them these resources, um, I think that's a good way to get to get everybody involved. Because if, like I said, if you're not sick, you know somebody who is, you know somebody who's taking care of somebody, and just spreading the word, starting local, basically building out what Emily said. I think those are good ways to get to reach out. Is looking at you, e patients. Great themes, really. Reaching out, starting local, and that's what we're doing here with tonight's uh, broadcast. We are reaching out to students all over the world who are watching this, interested in learning more about how to engage, to become engaged students, engage, engage healthcare providers, to engage with patients. We have a student leadership program. Uh, applications do end on uh, January 20th. Please go to our website, medicinex.stanford.edu, and learn about this incredible opportunity to learn more about how you, yourself, can become more engaged with the healthcare innovation community around Medicine X where you can learn about participatory medicine, 
about emerging technology at the intersection of medicine and how we can work in partnership with patients to innovate healthcare. I am going to let Nikki have the last word tonight. I'm going to wrap things up here by first thanking everyone so much for joining us today for this episode of Stanford MedX Live. We'll see you back here on Tuesday, January 21st, 2014, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, when we'll discuss wellness and self-care at Medicine X. And we'll have a chance to get into the wonderful goodness that is the wellness room at the conference and talk about how we all need to take time to take care of ourselves before, during, and after the event. As a reminder, Stanford Medicine X is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't done so yet, please take a moment to like us on our Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX, so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. From all of us here at Stanford Medicine X, we want to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to join us again on Thursday, January 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford MedX Live featuring a new patient engagement design class from the Stanford University School of Medicine called Engage and Empower Me. This week, we are featuring world-renowned behavior design expert BJ Fogg, along with our own e-patient speaker, moderator, uh, Stanford MedX e-patient advisory board member, Britt Johnson. Thank you guys for taking the time to tune in tonight with us. Thank you panel for joining us and for everyone out there and being part of the conversation. Um, from all of us at Stanford MedX, including uh, the real Zoe Chu, who is making a guest appearance tonight. We will see you next time. Thanks for joining us.